The universe is meant to be inhabited and shaped by consciousness. But what exactly is creation? What are the processes involved behind the act of something coming into existence? Well, these topics are sometimes largely philosophical and require collaborative non-bias to extrapolate a common theme that's agreed upon. Thus, it's not a surprise these fields get pushed into this term pseudoscience, seen by many as unworthy for further debate. It's very easy to say that something doesn't exist just because we can't see it, but in many cases we can measure the unexplainable. When we look at matter in any form, gas, liquid, or solid, the atoms are simply spaced more closely or further apart. Everything in these three states has a vibrational quality to it, as well as a wavelength. Everything in the universe, to the smallest scale, is vibrating a certain tone, a signature frequency, and any frequency that matches with it will cause resonance. Sound is the prime building block of our universe, as everything exists in a certain wavelength. But how do we know that for sure? Visible light is about 0.0035% of the measurable electromagnetic spectrum. This makes up everything that we can see, including distant stars and our surroundings. Everything in the EMF spectrum, including visible light, is a waveform, a frequency, and a sound. Many birds use UV light to communicate with each other, but we don't see these light shows happening around us. The mantis shrimp is known to be able to see more of the EMF spectrum than any other being, perceiving UV, infrared, polarized light, as well as other parts of the spectrum that we cannot. If we were able to see the entirety of the EMF spectrum, everyone's cell phones would have a tether to its tower or its satellite. On top of things like Wi-Fi, text messages would be seen flying through walls and people like a massive color current. Every radio station and nearby phone call would flood your ears, and the night sky would be the most intricate and bright stained glass mosaic known to existence, as there wouldn't be a single dark spot in it. So when we really think about it, what we know as daylight could be compared to walking in the dark with a candle. What we need to keep in mind is that as we raise our conscious frequency, the aforementioned veils of experience that await ahead are delineated by sound and light barriers. We could consider the EMF spectrum as one TV channel in an infinite set of dimensions. The laws we make as we observe them are relative to our realm, but things would be much different if our perception were to switch from the particle experience to antiparticle, or even a state of pre-matter. All of these states of the universe are continual, as we are the ones navigating through them. Much like a liquid turning to a gas where there is change in the wavelength, raising our awareness is like raising our perception to new sound and new light. We'll talk a lot more on dimensions in an upcoming video. Nikola Tesla was the first scientist of our known era to have realized that sound is the cleanest and purest form of free energy. And while whether his attempt to harness the energy of the Earth's continual frequency worked or not is up for debate, his famous quote, the Earth rings like a bell, is speaking of what we now know as the Schumann resonance. The Schumann resonances are a set of spectrum peaks in the extremely low frequency portion of the Earth's EMF spectrum. These are global electromagnetic resonances generated and excited by lightning discharges globally between the Earth's surface and the ionosphere. Since Tesla's time, many scientists have uncovered incredible things within the studies of sound and frequency. The infamous Baxter effect, as observed by Cleve Baxter, a former interrogation specialist for the CIA, was brought to light through a series of experiments in which Baxter wired a polygraph to a plant, producing stunning results. He observed that after introducing negative actions to the plant, such as burning or cutting it, the plant would seemingly freak out on the polygraph charts every time this action was simply thought of again, and this reaction from the plant repeated consistently. This experiment continued to work through a concrete wall as well. This tells us two things. One is that plants do have some measure of consciousness to them, as we know plants communicate with each other, and to assume that it's simply mechanical and chemical is the easy path. Just like assuming our souls don't exist beyond our bodies just because we can't take a polygraph or a camera with us. The second thing that we can gain from the Baxter effect is that thoughts are waveforms too, 
and thoughts affect reality just as much as sound does. Dr. Masaru Emoto provides us with stunning thought experiments many of us might have tried out in our own elementary school science fairs. He observed that when inflicting negative and positive thoughts onto separate containers of water and freezing them, the patterns in the ice crystals are harmonic in the positively treated container and chaotic and messy in the negatively treated ice. Many other experiments were done around water being able to store vibrational memory, but what's similar here to grade school is harmony and disharmony. Some of you might have done or seen someone do this, but when we elicit continual harmonic or disharmonic frequencies onto two plants that receive equal treatment, their growth is still affected by the frequencies or music we saturate them in. Sound manipulates reality, and the degrees in which something is affecting us might be greater than we can perceive. On the notion of music, it is important to separate lyric from rhythm. If either is disharmonic or harmonic, these affect us energetically as well, beyond just the water we're made out of vibrating along with it. The seven primal sound tones of our experience match the seven primal colors of visible light, which also each match a set of fixed geometries within their respective tones. We know these in music as A, B, C, D, E, F, and G. We'll talk more about these connections in a later video. Using sound, we can already do wondrous things quite casually. Acoustic levitation is often used in advertisement to lift smaller objects, but the concept isn't new to us as Tibetan monks use this technique to move larger objects, and quite infamously, Michael Tellinger, a South African archaeologist, provides us with stunning evidence of acoustic levitation being used to build the pyramids themselves, as well as gold mining occurring in the South African region using this technology. But we'll have an entire video dedicated to that later. Acoustic levitation is a method for suspending matter in air against gravity using acoustic radiation pressure from high intensity sound waves coming from multiple angles. Coral Castle in Florida is also suspected to have been built with acoustic levitation, as the massive modern megalithic site was entirely built by one person. Cymatics are tonal phenomena that occur when a surface is charged with a sound frequency. This can be done in many ways, but the most famous one you might have seen is sand on a metal plate, vibrating as the frequency is turned up, producing stunning geometries that are fixed at certain tones. This experiment is repeatable, producing the same geometries at the same fixed frequencies. These shapes aren't random, they come from the background templates of our universe upon which sound manifests form as we know it. The last concept we'll discuss in this video is called morphic resonance. Developed by Dr. Rupert Sheldrake, the concept of morphic resonance is a new interpretation of memory storage in the brain and biological inheritance. It teaches that memory isn't stored as material traces inside brains, which are more like TV receivers than video recorders, tuning into influences from the past. And biological inheritance isn't entirely dependent on genes or modifications of the gene, much of it depends on morphic resonance from previous members of the species. Morphic resonance is a connection across time from the past to the present. And it's a process that occurs between organized patterns of activity on the basis of similarity. What it means, in effect, is that each species has a kind of collective memory. So every giraffe tunes in by morphic resonance uh, to the form and to the behavior of previous giraffes. Um, every crystal, as it crystallizes, tunes in to the way that previous crystals of the same chemical crystallized in the past. So there's a kind of memory given by morphic resonance in all kinds of things. And in the realm of animal behavior, for example, it leads to quite striking predictions. If rats learn a new trick here in London, then rats all around the world should be able to learn the same trick quicker just because the rats have learned it here. The more that learn it, the easier it should get everywhere else. And there's already evidence that this actually happens from studies of rats in laboratories. Um, when lots of rats have learned something, other rats all around the world find it easier to learn. 
And this doesn't depend on any normal kind of connection between uh, the different rats or the places. It happens because of morphic resonance on the basis of similarity. The same applies to crystals. When a new chemical is made for the first time, it's usually very hard to crystallize it. And as time goes on, it gets easier to crystallize all around the world. And uh, I think the reason for this is that morphic resonance connects up the crystals so they tune into a kind of collective memory. So morphic resonance works through morphic fields, the organizing fields of chemicals and biological systems. Um, and the word morphic comes from the, the Greek word for form. So it's a kind of resonance to do with form, pattern and organization. So, therefore, each individual inherits a collective memory from past members of their species and also contributes to the collective memory, affecting other members of the species in the future. This concept has been explored in many different experiments, and it creeps into the slightest nuances of our life, as well as providing a solid backstory for the origin of our instincts, or gut feeling. Dr. Sheldrake has written many fantastic books on the subject, which we'll link down below with other suggestions for this video's topics, and we'll cover morphic resonance a bit deeper later on. For now, let's look back on the key meaning of resonance, a frequency that matches another frequency. Things like thoughts, symbols, and sentences are all unique waveforms, and if any of them resonate with you, we urge you to follow them, wherever you find them. Thank you.